Jubilee in June, part two. This morning we're going to look at sin, slavery, cycles of suffering. You might ask, Jubilee? Like this is a heavy topic. And I just have two comments about that. First of all, see it as part of the whole package. This is part of the Jubilee series. And I trust even by the end of the worship service, you'll understand how this ties in directly with Jubilee. But secondly, a hint in terms of how it ties in. The Heidelberg Catechism tells us that to really live, to live in and die in, in the joy and the comfort of the realization that our lives are not our own, but we belong to our faithful Savior, we need to know a number of things. And one of the things that we need to know is the depth of our sin and misery apart from the grace of God. In other words, to really, really rejoice, to have jubilee and jubilation and celebration, you need to know what it's like to be a slave. And we all have to come face to face and recognize in the mirror of God's word what it's like to be a slave if we want to know what it's like to really rejoice in our freedom. Slavery. It's a powerful topic. And I'm going to tell you a story. There's a man who said, I was a seaman, a slave trader, and for a time, a slave myself. This person has a heavy story. He was in England, and he fled from England as a deserter of the army and went to Africa. In Africa, he was pressed into services by a, a press gang, a work gang, and he was beaten ruthlessly. He, he was whipped until strips of flesh came off his back and his back bled. He became a slave trader sailing the seas with slaves, trading them for commercial value. And then, left in a time of illness, he became a slave to a black lady who was his owner. So he, former slave trader, became a slave of a slave. He describes his life later on, saying, I never met a man with a more vile mouth than mine. In fact, he describes how as a sailor on a ship with the roughest imaginable crew and with a sea captain that was as rough and crude as them all, they cringed at times with his profanities and even his godless sea captain reprimanded him for his language. Who was that man? Who was that sea man, that slave trader, that slave of a slave? He was none other than John Newton the one who later, by the grace of God, was set free and wrote Amazing Grace. People sing it with joy, with feeling, with recognition that, that we're really all, to some extent, slaves. We should sing it together, shall we? Let's sing it. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me.
Imagine that. Imagine those words coming from someone, a seaman, a slave trader, a slave of slaves. After John Newton was reminded of the grace of God and realized that truths that he had been taught as a child and that he had forgotten and forgotten and forgotten again and again, he had put on his mantle this text from Deuteronomy 15, verse 15. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt and the Lord your God redeemed you. And each time he was tempted to forget, he needed to look at this, his life's text. Now, people of God, slavery is not just something from the 17th and 18th century. Slavery is not just from the era of John Newton. There's categories of slavery today. Here's a category, human trafficking and exploitation. Slavery, modern slavery. One website says there are an estimated 20.9 million people trapped in some form of slavery today. It's sometimes called modern day slavery, sometimes human trafficking. At all times, it is slavery at its core. Human trafficking, sexual exploitation, child labor. There, there are children in the world who don't have a life 12 hours, 14 hours, 16 hours, slaving in the sweatshops, slaving away to produce things that people in the third world have to make so that people in the first world can get inexpensive items for their luxury. There is systemic slavery in the world today. That's a category. It's another category of slavery, and that's addiction. There are people who are so caught up in substance abuse, alcohol, drugs, that they become the slave to the substance. Food, Food can become addictive. And people aren't in control, but they are controlled by, by their desire and their want and by their biological, their physiological res response to substances that have gotten into their bodies. Smoking. And all kinds of addictions. Workaholism. Pornography. other forms of, of behavior that are endangering to self, that dehumanize. Those are forms of slavery, where people are being controlled by circumstances or substances rather than being in control in a godly and God-glorifying way. Hebrews talks about a third category of slavery, fear of death. Maybe you don't think about it that way, but, but look at it from the perspective of Hebrews 2. Fear of death is a form of slavery. If we have to go through our life always wondering, what would happen if I were to die? Where would I be? If we have to go through our whole life remembering the wrong things that we've done in our life and wondering, am I really, truly forgiven? What, what would happen if you come into the presence of God today or tomorrow? Do you know that all of your sins have been forgiven? And do you think that you could stand in God's presence, that you could look Jesus in the eye and not have to be worried about your eternal future? 
Hebrews recognizes that it is one of the most enslaving thoughts, one of the most enslaving concepts to remember our history, to know the wrong things that we have done, to list the times that we fell into temptation, and then to have to face death and eternity. These are categories of slavery. And Hebrews 2 verse 15 says, Jesus came to free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. That's jubilee. We can say slavery, not in our world. Oh yes, it's out there. But of course, that's just an escape. The categories of slavery that we've seen this morning are a reminder that all of our lives, to one extent or another, are touched by these concepts of slavery. And I'm a slave to this device that isn't working. Now it is. Jubilee. <laughs> slavery is essentially connected to sin. People of God, if you think of all of those aspects of slavery that we've looked at this morning, the, the concept of exploitation, human trafficking, misusing people, treating them as objects, that's sin. That's sin. If we think of slavery as addiction, it's connected to sin. If you think of slavery as fear of death, that power of the fear of death lies in the recognition of sin. And so we need to realize that these various forms of slavery turn people into objects. They, they take away the image of God, which is true righteousness and holiness. They take away that opportunity to live as, as the ambassador of, of God in God's kingdom and to be a blessing to other people, and they reduce people into objects. And other forms of slavery that we've looked at this morning, many of them are graphic. But you and I need to recognize that there's a continuum. There's a continuum from, from not extreme to the most extreme. And it's so tempting for us to take a look at the most extreme forms of slavery and we say, well, yeah, that's, that's obviously horrific. Sure good that we're not there. The reality is there's a continuum. And all of us that sometimes use other people selfishly. And there are times when all of us treat other people inappropriately. And in doing that, to some extent, we dehumanize them and we devalue them and we turn them into objects and we don't recognize that they are truly, beautifully and gloriously created as image bearers of God. And for that, you and I, we, we all need to repent of those times when we have done that and when we do that and when we are, in that sense, slave traders. Slavery is essentially connected to sin because it devalues human life. And, and we ought to be the opposite. We ought to be encouraging people to flourish, to develop their God-given gifts and abilities and talents, to live in joy and, and to be fulfilled rather than holding people down. And where we fail to do that, we need to repent. And we need to be set free from that. Because slavery is often synonymous with suffering. I would, I would dare say it's always synonymous with suffering. It puts people into positions of vulnerability. Slavery takes away the, the right of people to live freely in the presence of God. And by treating them as objects makes them vulnerable. Addictions, slavery, and suffering go together. They become virtually synonymous. But the good news of the Word of God, the good news of the Bible is that slavery is broken by the power of God. And that's really the message from Genesis to Revelation. 
God breaks the power of slavery. It's in the nature of God to free his people. When Adam and Eve were in the garden and Adam and Eve fell into sin and Adam and Eve were lined up to receive the consequence of death and fear comes into their heart and the fear of death. At that moment, God is there saying, I love you. And God is reassuring them that there will be a new covenant and a new creation and they will be set free. God, God starts breaking the power of slavery the first day of sin in the Garden of Eden. It's in his nature. The celebrated liberation from Egypt, the text, Deuteronomy 15, 15, that became so important on the mantle of John Newton. God sets his people free from slavery. And Egypt represents that. Egypt represents slavery. It's bondage. And it becomes a metaphor for all of the slavery and bondage that we can, that we can imagine. And God says, I know your Egypt. I know your individual Egypt. I know your personal Egypt. I know what's in your history. I know what has made you a slave. And I'll set you free. He brings liberation through the life of Christ. And Hebrews chapter 2 reminds us that we have the most incredible Savior. We have a glorious Savior. We have a Lord Jesus Christ who became fully human, stepped into the slavery of this world, realized what it was like to have all of the suffering and all of the pain that comes with slavery. And he did it to set us free. So people of God, we need to appreciate the freedom that we have from slavery. What a glorious salvation. What a, what a savior that he can break the bonds of slavery. Do you go through life with that conscious recognition that if it were not for the liberating power of Jesus Christ, our condition would be hopeless, our circumstances would be absolute suffering, and our eternity would be hell. That's the slavery that we would all have apart from Jesus Christ. And so we need to go through life with joy, recognizing that we who once were in that condition in which we could be condemned as slaves are now set free in Jesus Christ and we have been given a freedom to be free from the fear of death. We don't have to worry. If we belong to God through Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven, the slaveries of the past are done and we are set free. Romans 8 verse 1 says, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Jesus Christ. The chains are gone. The prison is open. And we're to live in that freedom. We're to use that freedom to live graciously, serving God, loving God, being a blessing to people around us. But you know that the, the sad thing is that sometimes, even though in our head we know that Jesus came to set us free, and even though we know in our head and in our theology we know that we are not slaves, Somehow in our emotions, somehow in our heart, we still feel like slaves. And there are things that still haunt us. And there are relationship dynamics, or there are cycles of suffering, or there are unresolved issues, or there are memories. Memories of things that we did wrong or memories of things that others did wrong that make us in our minds slaves. And people of God, that's what Jubilee in June is all about. Because God breaks the power of sin. 
And God breaks the slavery. And some of those things that we're carrying around as haunting memories of the past are things that we're dealing with today through the power of Jesus Christ and through the indwelling gift of the Holy Spirit. We need to write them on a paper and put them in a box and burn them because we are free. That's Jubilee in June. What does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly with your God. That is using your freedom not to enslave other people and not to enslave yourself but to bring to joy and to fruition the freedom that we have in Jesus Christ. John Newton wrote another song. He wrote a number of songs. There's about five of them in our hymn book. I'm going to end with this one. This is number 614 in our Psalter hymnal. Day of judgment, day of wonders, hark the trumpet's awesome sound, louder than a thousand thunder, shakes the vast creation round. How the summons will the sinner's heart confound. At his call the dead awaken, rise to life from earth and sea. All the powers of nature shaken by his look prepares to flee. Careless sinner, what will then become of thee? But to those who have confessed loved and served the Lord below, he will say, come near, you blessed. See the kingdom I bestow. You forever, you forever shall my love and glory know. That's Jubilee. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, when we think of slavery, our hearts are sad. Sad for the millions around the world who live in modern slavery. And Father, we pray that you will use your church, that you will use each one of us to be part of the solution to set people free. Father, when we think of slavery, our, our hearts are sad because we recognize areas of our lives that were trapped and enslaved by sin. We recognize our vulnerability. We recognize pain that we have caused and pain that we have endured. Father, when we think of the word slavery, our hearts are glad. A peace comes into us knowing that Jesus Christ became a slave to sin. Not to commit sin, but a slave to suffer the results of sin so that we could be free. And then our hearts are glad because the chains are gone. The prison is open and we are free. Father, when we think of slavery, our hearts are confused because somehow in this life we live with that mixture of of sadness and of joy. We are free and then we go back. We are free but not quite. We are free but not yet. And Father, we pray that you will help us to take your word at face value and to truly, in the depth of our heart, believe that for those who are in Jesus Christ, there is no condemnation. Give us humility, Father, to recognize the areas that entrap and enslave us. Give us the courage to write them on a piece of paper and put them in the box to burn. 
Father, we pray that through the power of your grace, newness of life will flourish in us all. In Jesus' name, amen.